So, step number four, relate the passage contextually. Read, realize, retrace, and then relate the passage contextually. Remember the two most important words when it comes to interpretation? Context rules. Come on, repeat that with me. Context rules. Say it as if you really believe it. Context rules. That's always, those are the two most important words when it comes to interpretation. So we've given you there what is, uh, uh, that's, this is just what we said, context rules. And then we gave you there what we call the logical context. The logical context. So you start with the text right there. And a lot of times we take a text out of its context and that's, that's when it becomes a pretext. But the text, and then you look at the immediate context. The immediate context is the paragraph division in your Bibles. Remember what we mentioned last, uh, yesterday? The paragraph divisions are not inspired. The verse divisions are not inspired. The paragraph titles are not inspired. You know, they were just added later on. When Paul wrote those words, you know, there were no divisions there. So you can disagree with the divisions, but at least these are scholars who did this and they think that's the paragraph division. So that already helps for us. That's already a help for us. And then you go to the major section. That can be the whole chapter. I do not know, depending on the text. And then you have the book context. That's the whole book. The context of the whole book. And then you have the same author. You have the same testament. And then the whole Bible. We'll take this one by one. And so let's uh, consider first the text. How to look at the context. All right. Let's uh, use a verse here. We familiarly uh, use this verse in evangelism. Let's read together Revelation 3.20. Ready? Read. All right, so Revelation 3.20. First thing you do, you go to the immediate context. What's the immediate context? The paragraph division. Paragraph. Okay, open your Bibles, please, and tell me what's the paragraph division. Where do you find Revelation 3.20? What verse does the uh, paragraph start? Revelation 3.20? Again, not all Bibles are like this. I don't even know if the, uh, the electronic Bibles, they, if they have paragraph divisions. Verse 14. All right. So we already have somebody there. Verse 14. And what's the title of verse 14? The Church of Laodicea. All right. So there's verse 20. It's inside that paragraph. That's the immediate context. So immediately you can see there, Revelation 3.20 is addressed to a what? A person, an individual, or the whole church? It's the whole church. All right? It's the church of Laodicea. Now, is this a Christian or non-Christian? Aha! Uh -huh. Revelation 3.20, the context is the whole church, and it's a Christian church. And yet, when we use it today, we use it to an individual who is a non-Christian. We actually use it out of its context, you know. And, uh, but that's the context of Revelation 3.20. So this is a Christian, and that's a church. It's addressed to the whole church. Now, what could be the possible reasons that could contribute to this well, where Christ is actually outside the church and is knocking to come inside the church? What could be possible reasons? You know, sometimes churches are not really Christ-centered. Is that possible that the church is not Christ-centered? They're actually focused more on the pastor, not on Christ. They're actually focused more on the money, the finances of the church, rather than Christ. Some churches are tradition-centered. Some churches are, you know, a family. There's a particular family that is in control of the church, you know, that, that's the clan that you don't dare to because if they leave, then more than half of the church will leave. You know, some churches are like that. It's not really Christ-centered. A lot of things can happen inside the church where Christ is actually outside and He wants to come in. But then what's the beauty here? How many people do you need in order for Christ to come inside the church, to go back inside? How many people do you need? One. It says there, if anyone... Here's my voice. And that anyone, especially if it's the pastor, wow, that's a lot of uh, advantage already. If the pastor will just say, wait a minute, we're having a problem in our church right now. One clan is fighting against another clan. Let's have a, a ceasefire. 
Let's declare a prayer and fasting for one month and let's just focus on Christ. Christ, we want you to come in. We know our, our church is in crisis right now. We are focused more on the money. We are focused more on personalities. We are focused more on these things. Christ, you're not inside the church. We want you to be inside this. You know, if it's the pastor, wow, that can really hasten things. And yet, you know, that, that's an issue today. Christ is actually outside the church. Now, another reason could be, is it possible that the pastor himself is not a Christian? I tell you that's possible. It happened, I won't mention where, but it happened, I can mention the area, it happened in Mindanao, but I won't mention the church. They had an EE, you know EE? Evangelism Explosion. And after the EE, the pastor realized that he has not received the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of the EE, he prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow! That's, that's amazing, isn't it? That a pastor can be the pastor of the church and yet not... But you know, that happened in Russia before the fall of communism. Christians were underground. They would have prayer meeting one time. And, you know, while they were having prayer meeting, there was this heavy banging on the door. And so they opened the door and then two soldiers with AK-47 entered and then said, those who are the three are Christians, get out! And people scampered, they got out and then they closed the doors. And then people were now crying and then holding hands and they were ready to die for Christ. And then the two soldiers announced, we are Christians too. We just want to make sure that the non-Christians are no longer here. Uh, let's continue with the prayer meeting. Where's the pastor? Wala na tumak muna! The pastor already got out. And so that's possible, you know. And that's why the reason why we use this Revelation 3.20, not as an interpretation, but as an illustration. That if it's possible for Christ to be outside the church and come knocking in, how much more for an individual person who, was not really, who, do not, uh, who does not have Christ in his heart? Christ can actually come in into your heart. So sometimes we use that as an illustration, but not as an interpretation, because we know this is dealing with a whole church, and it's a Christian church. All right? Another sample Okay, let's have, uh, by the way, the major section can be the whole chapter or two chapters. So if you have, starting with verse 14, you have Laodicea. What's the church before Laodicea? Philadelphia. What's the church before Philadelphia? Sardis. Before Sardis? Thyatira. Before Thyatira? You have Pergamos. And then before Pergamos? You have Smyrna. And then before Smyrna, you have Ephesus. So here you have, starting with chapter 2, you have here the seven churches. That's the major section. Revelation 2 and 3, it's the same context. The whole two chapters, it's about Christ evaluating the churches. So there are commendations and there are recommendations to these churches. Okay, so that's the whole church. And geographically, you know that uh, from, from Patmos, Christ, uh, Paul was asked to write to these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. But let's have another sample. How about this one? You know, we love this verse. It's a promise. We think it's a promise, especially when you run out of budget. Let's read this together. Ready, read. Wow. We love that verse, isn't it? Now, let's go to our Bibles now. Look at the paragraph division, the immediate context here. What's the paragraph division? Revelation, uh, uh, Philippians 4.19. So where, where do we start to look for the context? Verse 10. Okay, in my Bible, uh, verse 19 is down there, but in my Bible, verse 14, you already have a title there, at least in my Bible. There's, verse 14 is the title of thanks for the gifts. All right, thanks for the gifts. And then if you analyze the context, before the Apostle Paul mentioned verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs, what did this your, who's referring, who's being referred to by your? The Philippian church. Before that, he said, you sent me aid again and again. You sent me aid again and again. You know, the Philippian church, they heard Apostle Paul is under house arrest. He will actually be sent to prison because he, he elevated his case to Caesar. Because he's a Roman citizen, he has the right to elevate his case to Caesar. And while he's being processed, he has to wait, he has to go to prison. 
But if he has the money, he can, have un he can be under house arrest. So because of the Philippian church, they sent him aid again and again, he was only under house arrest. He was not actually in a dungeon because of the money that they sent. But here's the thing. Even though he is under house arrest, he was chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day, he's chained to a Roman guard. And there's a changing of the guard every six hours. And then, not only did they send money, they sent a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Now, that's a lot of help. There was a man who can assist Paul who was chained to a Roman guard, who can wash the dishes, who can wash his clothes, who can feed him. There was that man that they sent. Not only a man, they also sent money so that he can just be an under house arrest. And because of that, he gave this promise, Philippians 4, 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Friends, if you're not involved in the work of the gospel, giving your tithes and offering, offering yourself to work in the gospel, in the vineyard, and you have a hard time with your money, you run out of your money, you don't claim Philippians 4.19 because it's not for you. It's only for those who are engaged in the gospel, using their own money, using their own resources, sending themselves to the harvest field. Philippians 4.19 is for you. Alright? So that's the context. And yet a lot of Christians, you know, they use that, they run out of budget, they're not even giving tithes and offering. And they're not even helping in the church. You know, sometimes those who are not helping in the church, they're the ones who are criticizing those who are helping the church. Wow. That's tough, isn't it? And so again, the context will help us in our understanding, especially the application. One more, and then we'll take the break, uh, take our uh, picture taking. But here's one verse that we love because it gives us what will answer our prayers. Let's read this together. Matthew 18, 19. Ready? Read. Wow. That's almost like a blanket promise, isn't it? A blank check. Because it says there, if two of you on earth agree about anything, wow, anything, and then it says there, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Blank check. Now let's go to our Bibles. Let's look at the immediate context. Matthew 18, 19. What's the immediate context? Where does the paragraph start? Verse what? 15. All right, verse 15. And there's a title here. What's the title here? A brother who sins against you. So that's the context of Matthew 18, 19. So if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. We talked about this yesterday. It is the one who's offended who has to take the initiative to be reconciled to the one who's offending him. Just between the two of you. Tapos, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if does not listen, take one or two others along. So here in, in 19, what we have here, so I tell you, if two of you on earth, who is this two? Okay, who's this two? Who, who are these two? The offended and the offending party. So the two of you will agree. This is not a blanket promise on answered prayer. It's just the agreement. You know, I, I was in a reconciliation meeting and uh, we made use of this. Okay, we'll agree here. Huh? Pag ikaw ang nagsisinungaling dito, because you're telling us you're telling the truth and you're telling us you're telling the truth. Now we're going to agree on this. We will commit this to the Lord. Ang gagawin natin, kung ikaw nagsisinungaling, bahala ka sa buhay mo. God will be upon you. God's judgment will be on you. Will you agree to that? Yes, Pastor, I'll agree to that. Kung ako nagsisinungaling, then God's judgment be on me. We agreed. Ganun nangyari. And so, that's, this cannot be just a blanket promise because again, two of you agree on earth. Eh, merong young people, lima yung leaders ng young people, five of them, they're about to have a youth camp in the mountains. And then they pray, they held hands, lima sila, Lord, we agree. We're not just to wear five. And we agree that it will not rain so that our program will be smooth and will be accomplished. You know, the goals that we have set for our youth camp. Lord, we agree and we claim Matthew 18, 19. You said, if two of you agree. Lima yan. 
And then, up there in the mountain, there were farmers who were Christians. Limang farmers nagawakan ng kamay? Lord, we agree that it will rain so that our plantation, Lord, our, our harvest will not be affected. Lord, we claim Matthew 18, 19. You said, if two agree, we're five, Lord. And the Lord was listening to these two prayers, and God said, sabi ko na nga, sana hindi ako nagbigay ng promise na yan. <laughs> Ang Panginoon ba na-confused doon? Again, we're misusing this verse. We're using it as a prerequisite for answered prayer when it is taken out of its context. Now, the problem of miscommunication a lot of times is the preacher or teacher himself. Why? Because he or she is not able to convey accurately what he wants the people to understand. You know, sometimes our problem, we're using a language which is not our first language, like English, and, uh, you know, sometimes our vocabulary is just this much. And so we're trying to search for the right word. And the problem for us Filipinos is we think in Tagalog or Cebuano, and then we try to translate it, and before it comes out through our lips, wala na, tulog na yung tao. And so medyo matagal process you know. And uh, most of you are aware I was born in Manila, but I grew up in Cebu. And so, 12 years old, when uh, we went to Cebu, so first year high school, dun ako sa Cebu. And that's why I made you half-bake both ways. If I speak in Tagalog, people will notice, you're not a Tagalog, are you? And I'll tell them, I grew up in Cebu. But when I speak in Cebuano, people say, you're not a Cebuano, are you? Yeah, I was born in Manila. <laughs> and so, both ways, made you hilaw. But when I speak in English, people would ask, from what state did you come from? <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> And I would tell them, I came from a state of confusion. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yung English ko kasi bisaya pa rin yung dating. But there was this pastor one time, he was uh, preaching and he was, you know, he was uh, communicating with his congregation, trying to tell the congregation about his wife. You know, he's, she's in a delicate situation. She could not bear children. But he was trying to look for the right word. You see, my wife is... Ang unang nasabi niya, you see, sabi niya, my wife, ayan, my wife is unbearable. <laughs> no, what he wanted to say was that she cannot bear children. And people laughed. And so immediately, he, he changed the word. No, 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 no. What I really mean is that my wife is inconceivable. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sorry. But what I really mean is that my wife is impregnable. <laughs> And so, again, the problem of miscommunication a lot of times is the uh, preacher or teacher himself. When we do not prepare, you know, especially when we, when we preach from a language that is not our first language and you just think, you know, doon ko na lang iisipin as the Spirit leads na lang, a lot of times, you know, we, instead of just saying it in two sentences, we have to say it in ten sentences. We're wasting so much time and that's why there's the need for us to really prepare. Amen? And so, continuing, we are now looking at the logical context. You look at the text, the first thing you need to uh, look for is the immediate context, which is the paragraph division. If that's not enough, you go to the major section, which is the chapter uh, division of, uh, of that particular uh, text, and then the book context. The whole purpose of the book can determine the meaning of a particular verse in that particular, uh, in that text that you're looking at. So for example, John, when he wrote the gospel, he made this statement towards the end of his uh, gospel. He said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And then he said, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the, uh, very clearly, the purpose why he wrote this gospel is that you may believe that, Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. And so everything else in this uh, gospel should contribute to that purpose that people may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now what is interesting here, of course, is that he said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. 
Now, if you put together all the miracles Jesus Christ performed, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll have about 37, 38 miracles right there. But you know how many John included in his gospel? Out of the 38 miracles, only seven. Only seven. And he said, these seven, they are enough to convince you that Jesus is the Christ. The first miracle, turning water into wine. And then the last miracle, raising Lazarus from the dead. So, piling-pili yung mga miracles na yan. He said, this would be enough to convince you that Jesus is the Christ. So, that's the book context. Now, the problem with some of the books is you don't, the, the writer did not write clearly what the purpose of his uh, book is. So, you need to find a way to determine ano ba yung purpose why he wrote this letter. And sometimes there are books you don't even know who the author is. For example, what book? We don't know the author. The book of Hebrews. You know, some say it was a woman, maybe Priscilla wrote it, but because she's a woman, she did not, you know, uh, write her name in the book. Some say it was Luke who wrote it, but, you know, the vocabulary of Luke and Acts is quite different from the, from, uh, the book of Hebrews. Not Paul also. I believe it is Apollos. Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. Why? Because this is the Apollos project. All right. <laughs> So that's the, uh, that's the uh, personal bias, okay. But you know what? If you go into the book of Hebrews and do some investigative uh, research, looking at some of the verses, actually the writer gave us some clues. We do not know exactly who he is, but we know the purpose why he wrote this book. For example, in the last chapter of the book, he said, Greet all your leaders and all God's people. And then he said, those from Italy send you their greetings. Now, this is where we need the power of observation. When he said, those from Italy send you their greetings, that means he's writing to whom? Aha! Wherever he was writing from, it could be in Corinth, he could be in Jerusalem, he could be in Ephesus, wherever he was writing from, he's saying, there are Italians here with me. Those from Italy who are here with me, they are sending their greetings. That means the letter is going to where? It's going to Italy. All right? This letter to the Hebrews was actually going to Italy, and there are Italians there with him, and they're saying, Oi, paki regards na sa mga kababayan namin. Regards to the Italians who are here. So that's what he was saying. Now, which part of Italy do you think it was sent? Which particular city? Most likely, it's Rome. All right? Most likely, it's Rome. So we have the first clue. Most likely, this was written to the Christians uh, in Rome, in Italy. And then the next clue we have here in Hebrews 10, 34. He said, You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So what were the Christians in Rome undergoing? Persecution. So they were undergoing persecution. That's a clue already, right there. They're undergoing persecution. But then we know that the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. 16 chapters, 7,000 words. Now, do you have a clue there that the Christians, when he wrote that letter to the Romans, that they were undergoing persecution? Is there a clue there in the book? That they were, you know, being sent to prison, properties confiscated. Do you have that clue in the book of Romans? Nothing. Nothing. There's no mention of anything of any persecution being sent to prison or confiscation of properties. We know when the letter of Paul was written to the Romans. So, kung dito sa Hebrews, there was persecution, sa letter ni Paul to the Romans, walang persecution, which letter came first? Romans came first. Because if Hebrews came first, then he would have talked about the persecution. That is... Uh, uh, when he wrote the book of Romans. And so here, we have Paul's letters about 55 AD. That means the letter to the Hebrews was written before 55 or after 55? After 55. Okay, next clue. He said here in Romans 9, 1 to 4, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. This is the tabernacle that was set up, the first room, you have the lampstand, the table, the consecrated bread, and this is called the holy place. Behind the curtain was the 
most holy place, the holy police. He's describing what here? He's describing the temple. Now, very interesting, if you go through the book of Hebrews, he'll be talking, up, he'll be talking about the temple in the present tense. What is significant about that? Because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. September 6, 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Now, if he's talking about the temple in the present tense, that means this letter came about before the destruction or after the destruction? Before the destruction. Aha! So now we have a time frame here. The book of Hebrews was written somewhere before September 70 AD, but after 55 Something happened in between 55 and 70 AD. And what was that? Somebody sat on the throne and his name is Nero. And we know that he became crazy, wanted to rebuild Rome, destroy Rome, burnt Rome. Three-fourths of the city was destroyed and then blamed the Christians. And then there was an empire-wide persecution during his reign. And so most likely this letter to the Hebrews was written to the Christians there in Rome. 64 was when Paul died in uh, Rome. He was, uh, his head was, he was beheaded. And so, tell me now, what most likely is the purpose of the writer in writing the book of Hebrews? What's the purpose, do you think? To encourage them, you know, during the persecution. And so for them to stand up, for them to be firm about their faith. You read in Hebrews 11, the, you know, the, uh, the men, the heroes of the faith in chapter 11. And then chapter 12, you have this cloud of witnesses. Come on, let's continue running the race. Do not give up now. Chapter 1, chapter 2 is comparing Moses with Christ, you know, the law with Christ. You know, do not go back to Judaism because the, the Jewish Christians during this time, they have a unscathed close. They can go back to Judaism, which is free from persecution. But that is what the writer is saying. Do not go back to Judaism. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than the law. Christ is better than all of this. Let's continue to walk in Christ. All right? So we know the letter to the uh, Hebrews, uh, basically through the book context. So all those problematic verses or passages in the book of Hebrews, in that light, you know, in that context, it will have meaning now. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10, if you consider this context, then it will make sense now why he was saying those things. All right, so you have the book context and now the same author. We need to realize here, friends, our concordances, you know, sometimes you, you, you look into the concordance, because you want to search for a word. For example, the word is uh, faith. And because this word faith is, uh, you know, there's the concordance. Here are the references where the word faith is mentioned. The problem with the concordance, is it doesn't tell you what context that word faith was used. It just tells you where it was used. Many Christians assume just because it's in the concordance, therefore it's the same. But friends, you need to consider the same author. If two authors are using the same word, they could be using it in two different senses. You need to be careful about that. Alright? For example, let's divide this group, maybe just this group and this group. This is our Paul group and this is our James group. Alright? Let's do this. First, the Paul group. Let's read this together. Itong group na to. Ready? Read. But as an obligation... But trust God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So, what was he making contrast here? Choose two words here that is contrasting. He's contrasting what? Works and faith. Okay, he's contrasting works and faith. Now, let's look at the James group. Let's read together James 2, 14 and 18. Ready? Read. But someone will say, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Again, he's making a contrast between what two words? Faith and deeds. Basically the same, works and faith, faith and deeds. That's about the same. So here, 
are two passages where the word faith appears, where the word works or deeds appear, and yet, they're not in the same context. In fact, a lot of people consider the book of Romans chapter 4 and James chapter 2 to be uh, in contradiction in what it is teaching. But friends, we need to realize something here. First of all, in the Paul's group, what is he saying? Is he saying that you need works in order for your faith to be justified or no? Look at what he said. Man who does not work. You don't need works in order to justify your faith. Alright? But then in James' group, do you need faith? Do you need works to justify your faith? Yes. Faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save him? And that's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no way. Alright? Your faith cannot be, uh, that kind of faith cannot save you if it's without works. So a lot of people think, they assume, just reading this superficially, they think that Paul is teaching that we are saved by faith, not by works. While James is teaching that we are saved by faith plus works. You know, a lot of people make that kind of confusion because again, here they do not consider the context of the way they're using the words faith and works. So let's look closely at what Paul said. First of all, the Paul, uh, Apostle Paul said here, yes, he said, however to the man who does not work, but what? Trust. Trust God who justifies. That means, who is going to justify your faith, man or God? If it's God who justifies your faith, does God need works in order to determine if your faith is genuine or not? God doesn't need your works. He can see you through and through. He knows if your faith is genuine or not. That's why his faith is credited as righteousness. All right? God who justifies the wicked. Now, how about James? Who is the me? James. Show me. So it's man. Does man need works in order to justify your faith, in order to know if your faith is genuine or not? Yes. Oh, definitely. I cannot see your heart. You know, you can be attending church, but I do not know really what your intention is, what is really in your heart. Show me your faith, and then I will show you my faith. So friends, there's no contradiction. If we consider the author, their intention, what Paul is saying here, Paul is showing us, first of all, the root of salvation, while James is showing us the fruit of salvation, the question Paul is trying to answer is how to know you're a Christian, but the question James is trying to answer is how to show you're a Christian. They are not in conflict. They're working side by side. I'm sorry. They're working side by side, actually. Okay, did you see that? And then right there. Okay? And so, there's no conflict here. Again, in context, they cannot be in conflict because in con uh, they cannot be in conflict because of rule number six. Try to remember, please. Recipe number six. What's it? What is it? Understand it? Logically, two authors, as they write, guided by the same Holy Spirit, will not contradict themselves. All right, it's guided by the same Holy Spirit, and so there's a way to understand what they're saying in base, uh, based on the context. And then second to the last is same testament. Same testament. Not just same author, but same testament. We need to be careful, especially those of us who are preachers here. You know, sometimes preachers, they do a topical sermon. You know, the, the problem sometimes with a topical sermon is this. Because you're trying to develop a topic, you get a verse from the Old Testament, you get a verse from the New Testament, you get another verse here, you get another verse there, to develop your topic. Sometimes if you're not careful, the problem with topical preaching is you take a verse out of its context just to develop the topic. And of course, we'll be dealing with this in level three so that we know, you know, uh, how to uh, prepare good topical sermons if you are into topical rather than expository preaching. But same testament, there are certain things in the Old Testament that are no longer operational in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul made this very clear. In Colossians chapter 2, he said, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. You know, those are the kosher food. And with regard to religious festival, and then a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. So what is that? Religious festival, you know, all the religious festivals are on a full moon. 
There's only one of the seven feasts that is not on a full moon, and it's on a new moon, and that is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, no, the Feast of Trumpets, I mean. So the Feast of Trumpets is the only one that is on a new moon instead of a full moon. So these are the seven, six here, six a feast, the, uh, the, another feast here, the seven, and then the weekly Sabbath. But here the Apostle Paul said, these are only a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And so friends, what this is saying is that everything that we have in the Old Testament only are dress rehearsals for what Christ will accomplish. That's why the seven feasts actually is just a dress rehearsal for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all picture what Christ will accomplish eventually. Of the seven feasts, do you know how many feasts have already been fulfilled by Christ? Four feasts have already been fulfilled. All right? And so He already fulfilled the Passover. He already fulfilled the... Um, the unleavened bread and the first fruits, all in the three days that Christ died, buried, and then rose from the dead. And then Pentecost is the fourth feast, already fulfilled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We are now in the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And now we're waiting for the Feast of Trumpets, which is the rapture of the church. And then we're looking for Yom Kippur, the second coming of Christ. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, when Christ himself will tabernacle here on earth and reign for 1,000 years. And so these are just uh, dress rehearsals and so we need to be conscious of this because you know somebody asked me Pastor Roy David prayed in Psalm 51 take not the Holy Spirit from me do we can we still make that prayer today and I said if you're in the Old Testament that's right but in the New Testament that's no longer true because the Holy Spirit is not just with us the Holy Spirit is now in us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit he doesn't get in and get out you know once he indwells you, Ephesians 1.13, the conjunction until, until when is He in you? Until the redemption of all those who belong to Christ. Until the exact number of Gentiles come in, then that's when we have the rapture. Alright? And so the Holy Spirit stays with us. Again, we need to be careful when we're using the Old Testament and then the New Testament. But friends, everything is okay. You can use the entire Bible as long as you consider the Context. Two most important words when it comes to interpretation. Two words. Context rules. Context rules. And so again, you can be a topical preacher. No problem as you are, as long as you are in context. You know, uh, the rule for most of us who are exposed to preachers, you can preach a, a, a topical sermon once every five years and then repeat and then repent immediately. You know, <laughs> that's the bias of expositor preachers. But uh, again, it's okay as long as you consider the context. Now, when we relate the passage contextually, for example, we're using Romans 13, 11 to 14 as our example. Then you just have to uh, look at the context, Romans 1 to, uh, 1 to 17, 18 to 25. Now, all of this, it's not in your manual. I'm just showing you an example of uh, how to locate the context. If you're preaching from Romans 13, right there, 11 to 14, you will notice that this is already the gospel and the transformation of life. So you just locate the context because you're considering only that passage for your preaching that particular day. So you can divide the whole book of Romans into uh, uh, five topics. Uh, sin, chapter 1 to 3, salvation, 321 to 521, sanctification, 6 to 8, and then you have sovereignty, 9 to 11, and then service, 12 to 15. So when you're preaching from Romans 13, be mindful that you are now on the service. All right, subjection to authority is the topic of chapter 13. All right, so we're good. Step number one. What's step number one? Read the passage like a pro. Step number two, realize your subjectivity. Step number three, retrace the historical background. Step number four, relate the passage contextually. And then step number five, recognize the literary genre and figures of speech.